Good day, Clark. First of all, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me today. Could you please provide our audience with a little bit of background of you before we get into the main question? Sure, Guy, and thanks for having me. I'm Clark Quinn, and I've been on a 40 year plus campaign to understand and apply what cognitive and learning science has to say to performance and development with various roles, including academic, team leader, and now speaker, blogger at learnless.com, author of soon to be six books and consultant through Quinnovation. Well, thank you. Now for our main event. Can you please give our audience a five to 10 or more minute take on what to measure and how to measure uh, impact of instruction in an enterprise context? Sure. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is what not to measure. <laughs> um, too often, what we see is measures, and this comes out like an ATD's uh, State of the Workplace or State of the Industry report, and they have measures in there, and they're like, um, what does it cost to have a bum in a seat for an hour? What does that cost us to do? And what, you know, how many employees do we serve per L&D member? And a whole bunch of measures like this that are all about efficiency. And we, you know, we can compare ourselves to that measure and say, look, we're average. We're no worse than anybody else. Wonderful. And yet we have no idea whether that bum in that seat for the hour is doing anything for the organization. We have no idea if, you know, that having this many uh, employees served by this LMD unit are adding any value to the organization. So that's secondary information. To me, what we need to do first is start off measuring the important stuff. By the way, ROI, I don't mind it, but again, it too is secondary. And the simple reason for this is you could actually have a impact with an intervention that has a better ROI. And yet it's actually relatively small to the organ. This one doesn't have as much ROI, but it ha actually has a much bigger organizational impact. And if you only evaluated the relative ROI, you'd prioritize this one over this one, and it's not the best choice. So the first thing you want to do, the first thing you want to measure is performance outcomes. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here talking to you, guy, but um, the what are the gaps you have in the organization? What is the delta between what they should be and what you're currently seeing? And how are we going to fix that? And so you need to have those measures. Now, they're not necessarily L&D measures. You're going to have to cross the silos. You're going to have to go out and talk to these people. And so in the operations group, it might be the number of errors you're seeing in your manufacturing process. Um, it might be the time to get these things done. It might be you know, the number of accidents being held while you conduct this process. You know, in sales, it's going to be the, the time to close a deal, or it's going to be the number of sales per month per individual salesperson. There are a lot of really important measures that are absolutely critical to the organization. And you find these out, you know, they may be called KPIs or they may be just what these people come and tell you, they have a gap. But if they may come and tell you, oh, we need a course on this and you need to come back and say, well, what's the measure that tells you that and how will we know when we have fixed it? So these are the things we need to measure. We need to go in and work with these people. Say, what's the measure now? Let's try an intervention, let's look at the delta, and let's not stop until we've brought it to where it has to be or agree that we, where we get it to is as good as it can be. And then you know, we might do a back of this envelope calculation, say, well, that's gonna cost us this much to do, is it worth the, you know, the benefit we'll gain? So there, but it's based on real data. It's not based on some assessment that maybe this will happen. And you know, you're know you the guru of telling us sometimes learning isn't the right solution. It should be a performance support or change in incentives or adding you know resources to the workplace or just breaking down some myths that they're operating under. So there are a lot of ways in which they can go wrong. Um, so we have to start looking in. And this data does exist. They're in business intelligence tools that exist in the organization, what we want to do is start comparing that to our L&D data. So and increasingly we can go 
with finer granularity instead of just scoring, oh, they took this course and did that improve their performance? And that's not a bad thing to do, but you don't want to just look, they took this course, but does that improve anything? Everybody who takes the course now does better, then the course is worth it. But let's check that and validate that before we make that assumption. But we can go finer granularity for our own purposes. We can start looking at individual questions with tools like the Experience API. We can say, you know, everybody does struggles with this question. Um, maybe that's not a good question, or that's indicative of a fundamental problem in our teaching that means that we're not effectively addressing that. There are a couple different reasons, but we won't know unless we look at that data. So that's data we should be looking at. But then we go outside and say, everybody who does this question does better on the tests than the people who don't, or everybody who touches this resource um, is more successful in their sales than not. And we gather the X API data into an LRS, which is increasing to me the more important than an LMS. And LMS really is a course management system that lets us sign up for things and, and make things accessible, but it doesn't tell us a lot about the analytics. Instead, we want to aggregate an LRS and correlate that to the business data. So that to me is what's really important. But it's not just objective data. And objective data is sort of the gold standard but there's also subjective data. We care about customer experience and we don't want to you know, measure their galvanic skin response or the amount of you know, adrenaline in their bloodstream, a little invasive. So we ask them and the same thing for employee experience. We want to collect this data too. And it can be their engagement in the social media tools. If you're trying to create a culture of sharing, which we know is going to lead to better outcomes if it's done properly, um, are we seeing people beginning to contribute freely? Are we seeing them commenting on one another? Are we getting that output that comes from constructive interaction? So these are all valuable things we can and should be measuring, yet we have to figure out ways to do it. And we should be explicitly figuring out what we're looking for and what we want to do. Uh, there have been people who've talked about in social media tools, just if we've got activity, it is good. And that's not a bad baseline, but if we're expecting, for instance, if we put in a, a sharing tool in a sales organization, we should expect some specific outcomes. We should expect more sharing and we should expect um, better proposals and we should expect more success. And we should be looking for those and we can, but we have to think ahead of time, what are the outcomes we want? Now, uh, sort of one last area that encompasses two things. The first one is the, the, the ethical and cultural issues. What are you doing with that data and how are you using it? So is this data you should be collecting or is this getting a little bit into privacy? We should care about ethics. If we want to create a workplace that's humane, we should treat our people as um, citizens who have rights. And then, and you know, granted I'm, a, no, I'm from California, right? He's a cosmic jive, but we actually know that the more humane workplace leads to better outcomes for the organization and the individual. The other thing is, you know, how are we using this data? Are we using it to only to improve you to say this of ways we, you know, this is an area you could stand to improve or we use that as sort of a punitive measure. Oh, well, you're not good at this. We may have to cut you or stuff. There's a choices we have about what we do with the data. And I think we should consider that. And the other side of that, part of a good culture of learning, creating an organization, and I have this claim, optimal execution is only going to be the cost of entry and continual innovation is going to be the really sustainable differentiator for organizations. And that comes from continually learning. And that come, part of that is experimentation. So you should also be doing systematic experiments trying this versus that, trying out new technologies to see if it matches what your investigation or analysis of the affordances suggest. And then you should be measuring those because experiments real data. And if you look at uh, Garvin Edmondson and Gino's Dimensions of Learning Organization, they talk about concrete practices come from experimentation and documentation. Then you move that back into the what's known in our organization and you share that and recommend that we're now going to do these things this way. And an editorial soapbox, I argue that um, L&D should be putting in place those cultural elements about valuing people and experimenting and working out loud, getting ownership of it before they go out and proselytize it to the rest of the organization. So they should have their own data that says it works. 
but then they can take it credibly to the rest of the organization. And that's an opportunity for L&D to move beyond an order taker to actually becoming a strategic contributor to the organizational success. Art, thank you for sharing your insights with us today. Thank you so much. Have a great day. <laughs> thank you, guys.